Right, hello, good morning, welcome. Delighted you're all here and delighted, even more delighted to have this great panel to uh, discuss all this. I'm Nick Timmins, I'm a senior fellow here, but I suppose my role in this, when all this was happening, I was a journo on the Financial Times, trying to sort of second guess, leak, discover what most of this panel were up to when it was happening. Um, this, uh, there's a couple of tiny bits of uh, housekeeping before we get going. This is on the record, so if uh, you're in a sensitive position, you wish to be careful how you phrase your questions, but it is all on the record. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to tweet. Uh, can you make, turn your phones to silent, but you're still welcome to tweet. The hashtag social care. What we're here to do is explore the workings of the Dilnock Commission, or the Commission on Funding of Care and Support, to give it its formal title. Uh, I'm sure most of you can identify those on the panel, but just to be absolutely clear, we have two members of the Commission. We have Sir Andrew Dillon himself, who these days is Warden of Nuffield College and Chair of the UK Statistics Authority. And we have Lord Warner, Norman Warner, who has had many roles over the years, including being a civil servant, a Director of Social Services, a Special Advisor, an Author of Government Inquiries, and a Health Minister in the last Labour Government. We have Michelle Mitchell, uh, who these days is Chief Executive of the Multiple Sclerosis Society, but who during the period the Commission was sitting was Chief Executive of Age UK and therefore one of the key external stakeholders in this debate. At the very far end, of course, we have Paul Burstow, who was, of course, the social care minister of the coalition government at the time all this was happening. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to give Andrew about 15 minutes to talk and the others about 10, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, just to sort of tee you up slightly, I mean, just ahead of the election, there have been the most poisonous Punch and Judy row about the future of social care. Uh, between uh, Andrew Lansley and Andy Burnham, mm. both of whom seem to not be able to stand the sight or the sound of each other. Uh, and you know, massive rows about a death tax, a really, really poisonous debate. Um, so I suppose my opening, sort of just to tee you up, you know, how, when and by whom did you first get offered this job and what way do you want to take on <laughs> <laughs> what has been a tortuous and highly politicised issue? Uh, thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> How lovely it is to be here. Um, <laughs> before I will answer that question, but um, immediately, but let me begin by saying that it was the most enormous fun. It just was <laughs> fantastically enjoyable and exciting. It had its moments, but it was, I think it, you know, it and I've had, you know, done lots of different things, but it was just the most enormous fun. And that was really why when I was asked, I said yes. I said yes pretty quickly, although in fact, I. I had to speak to my wife and children, and I couldn't get through to them on the phone. I was asked um, on, I think, sometime in early, early mid-July. I had a phone call from David Bean, who's not here, but was at the time the, uh, the DG in charge of social care. Um, and I found it very easy to say yes, because uh, it seemed to me that this was, you know, it's, an, it's an important issue. It was, in some senses, a well-defined and small issue. So it's a hugely important issue. It was, you could contain it, you could think about it, you know. Um, it seemed to me as though it was ripe time. So yes, there'd been this terrible row, but there was a <coughs> terrible row because actually across the political spectrum there was a desire to do something about it. There was a recognition that, that something needed to be done. And I'd, I'd been a bit involved in the debate probably 15 years before I sat on a round free there was a Roundtree funded, got right Roundtree Commission study, um, and then the, so I, I, I had some interest in it. I'd worked in the general area of welfare state. I didn't feel I knew what the answer was, which I suspect is also quite important. You don't, you, you don't want to take something like this on if you think you already know, because then you're going to be in terrible trouble. Um, and, and I love social science, and, you know, brought it all together. So that was why, that was why so I, I was asked and, and found it very easy to say yes. I feel as though it's quite early on to be trying to reflect on the process. So I've tried to reflect on the process, but my guess is that in five or ten years' time, it will be easier to do that, and, and in particular easier to be more critical of the process than I am at the moment. I feel too close to it to, to see easy ways in which we could have done it much better. I'm sure there are those, it may be, that others will say. And the other thing I should be open about now is that um, I will be as open as I can be, but I had lots of conversations through this process that were simply were private uh, and it would be it would be dis discourteous to, to to open up some of those I think although it may be again that in 10 years time when time has passed it will be possible to do that so what characterized the process the way we work which I think is the um, 
One thing that I think is important is that, is that we were a small group. So there were just three commissioners, Norm, me and Joe Williams, uh, and, and that made things itself much more straightforward than a large group would have done because it meant that we had a weekly meeting, you know, we could easily phone one another up. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't a huge number of multilateral conversations to be had. So that meant that as we, as we learned together and, and, and started coming to a view, within the commission itself, there wasn't too much work to be done just to find out what was going on. We also had rather a small secretariat, a small and outstanding secretariat, and they were, they were fantastic to work with, astonishingly productive. And the distinction between the members of the commission and the members of the secretariat was not at all closely observed. Um, we had a secretariat that was drawn from Department of Health, Treasury, uh, DCLG, and DWP, uh, and they, they were wonderful to work with. Uh, and I think an important thing about that and the Commission's work as a whole was we did manage to, I think, integrate the various disciplines. So when, when, when critical of the way that government works, people will sometimes say, well, the policy, you know, the policy makers and the analysts will sit in, sit in separate boxes and you know, the policy makers will come up with a policy and then they'll send it to the analysts to have the numbers put in. We, we very aggressively didn't work like that. We worked I in a single group, and that turned out, I think, to be extremely important to the outcomes that we came up with. I think the single characteristic that was perhaps most important about the, the way we worked over, over the year was that we really did pause and try to think very hard at the beginning. <clears throat> so when I, when I was asked, I then went, I, I had two weeks' holiday coming up, and... Um, Sally Warren, who is here today, who was then at uh, Department of Health, I said, I, he said it would help me to have some reading. So before I went up to Northumberland, I was given a, I mean, literally, <laughs> a pile this big of all the things that had been written about this. So I spent several weeks just <coughs> sitting, under, sitting under the trees reading this stuff. And as I read it, I, I had a sense that actually this was an area where the policy question wasn't very clear. Well, there was a the very, very clear understanding that things were not as they should be, but not a very clear understanding of exactly what the core problem was. So we then spent quite a few months with, on occasions, an increasingly anxious set of secretariat colleagues not producing anything, <laughs> um, just trying to work out what the problem really was, drawing data together, talking to people, trying to, to be clear about what the core problem was. And I think... I think what I think at the moment is that the biggest contribution that the work of the Commission made was coming up with, with quite a simple but I think compelling description of what the problem was and a way of representing it and, and therefore talking about it and therefore talking about our solution. And that was this, this notion that the core problem, and we, we're not largely talking about the issues but I think I need to talk about this issue, the core problem was that the risk of needing long-term care was the one big risk that everybody faces, which at the moment is not pooled. I think once we characterised it like that, found a, found a visually arresting way of describing that risk, then we had a way of thinking about the problem that allowed us to think about what the possible solutions might be and then come up with a solution. So that period of... Uh, well, it, it was until after Christmas, I think. Yeah, so we started yeah, yeah. in July... And it wasn't until after Christmas that we felt confident that we really understood what the problem was. A and then once we really understood what we thought the problem was, the answer seemed relatively straightforward. So, so one lesson, I think, from the way that we approached it was that it really is worth putting a huge amount of effort into that process of defining the problem, really trying to be clear about that. As I say, once we got there, things seemed fairly straightforward. Another aspect of the way that we tackled it, um, I, I look back to my old mentor and colleague, John Kay, <coughs> and I remember, um, and this, this will be close to Jill Rutter's heart, um, Jill, who I think hel helped with the first edition of the British tax system, that great book about, tax, about, about 70 years ago. Um, th there's a passage in that, Jill may not thank me for that later, th there's a passage in that where, where John Kay and Mervyn King was thinking about reform describe a discussion which they either had had or an apocryphal discussion with the, the then Inland Revenue about the possibility of a local income tax, where the assertion had been made by officials that you couldn't possibly have a local income tax because how on earth would you deal 
with travellers. Now, the point that John and Mervyn made quite rightly is that may well be a legitimate issue, but it's not an issue that determines whether or not you should have a local income tax. And in any policy debate, there are, there are, lots, of issues, there are lots of very difficult implementation issues. However you do anything, there will be difficult implementation issues. But you need to make sure that you don't allow those to get in the way of coming up with your core concept of how it is that you're going on. I remember quite early on in the process, we, once we'd sort of had an idea of where we might be going, we had a flip chart um, on, which we, on which all of the problems that we could see with it were laid, and we labelled this the Board of Doom to try to lighten our <laughs> mood. And it would have been very easy to have allowed all of the all of those problems to occupy our attention too much at that stage. We came back to all of them once we were sure about our direction of travel. But until we were sure about the direction of travel, we tried not to let that kind of implementation issue uh, get too much in the way. The other crucial part of the way we worked is that we did a, a massive amount of engagement work. Uh, this, this was a, a subject area, and still is a subject area, where there's an extremely active stakeholder community, very interested, and we did an awful lot of work with them. Michelle and I, had, I don't think we'd ever met before this, so we got to know each other well, and that was true of an awful lot of other <coughs> members of the community. It's, it's quite a close-knit community, they're expert, and it was very important to get their views and also to carry them along with us. We put huge effort into that. We did the same with political parties, and we met often with ministers and their representatives, but we also met with the opposition with the full knowledge of the government. It was <coughs> extremely important to do that, to keep them in touch. We met with endless civil servants, which of course is always a delight. Um, <laughs> there were lots of departments that really cared about this. Um, the, you know, the, the obvious candidates, the Department of Health, Department of Work and Pensions, the Treasury. Funnily enough, the Treasury was interested. Um, we, we kept up a constant dialogue with all of these groups. Uh, Academics, we sought advice from quite a lot of academics, <coughs> some who were working very closely with us, but others who were more dispersed, and also with journalists. Um, throughout the process, we kept that dialogue open uh, as we were thinking to try and get feedback, and then as we moved towards being clear about what it was that we were going to say, it, it seemed to us all along that there was no point at all in it being a surprise to anybody. There were some risks with that, and indeed, I think the weekend before we published, so 10 days before we published, there was a completely misleading and inappropriate set of descriptions of what was going on in the Sunday press. But since you were quite likely to get that at some point anyway, it was actually quite advantageous to get that before we launched, so that when we did launch, everybody knew what was going on. It was tempting to think that we get to July 2011 and launch, and then we could all breathe a sigh of relief. But it hasn't actually been quite like that. Um, Norman's hair was still, you know, reasonably blonde rather than white <coughs> it was red. two years it was ago. Red. It, was red, it was red then, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, the, the, the period after we launched was a, was a hugely important part of the whole process in a way that I hadn't really imagined it would be. I'd hoped that we would get, you know, we'd, we'd have persuaded everybody. And by and large, by the time we reported, the stakeholder community was pretty supportive of what we were doing. Journalistic response has been pretty supportive, political response has been pretty supportive. I thought we publish and then you know, that would be it. Actually, I think in the six months after we published, I gave probably 100 presentations of, of the core ideas and had huge numbers of meetings with the stakeholder community, with politicians. With the, I mean, it, it really went on very intensively for six or seven months afterwards. Then there was a sort of hiatus when there wasn't much more that we could do, it was over to Paul and his colleagues in the Department of Health, over to Norman, his, Norman and his peers in the House of Lords, over to the stakeholder community to see whether enough pressure could be brought to bear. And interestingly, it was by no means clear at that point. So we started in July 2010, we reported in July 2011. The Prime Minister said, it, said, it, said he welcomed it. We had six months of stuff, but it still wasn't at all clear. Then there was a period of kind of relative radio silence running up to July of 2012, which, according to the uh, government's position in July 2011, must still have been the spring. Um, <laughs> in July 2012, uh, a really quite 
ambiguous public response was made, which, which was widely understood to be very disappointing. I didn't think it was as disappointing it was widely, because it, it was pretty clear to me that it wasn't the final word. Then in mid-August, um, it appeared to be the case that uh, one, of, one of the country's main tabloids had been, at least believed it had been given a story by uh, those close to the Prime Minister and those close to the Deputy Prime Minister, saying they were going to do it and they were going to do it at 35,000. So there was a kerfuffle in August, and then it all went quiet again. And it was only finally in February of this year that we got to a public announcement from the, from the, from the, our, our government that, that it was going to be done. And exactly what was going on in that eight or nine months was quite a lot of conversations in which quite a lot of people were involved. And in that period, the role of the stakeholder community, of the press, of uh, politicians who were not part of the government uh, by party, and also uh, people, including Paul, who got involved in producing something with Centre Forum, that role of people who were, were not the commission but really cared about taking this forward, keeping the voice up, seems to me to have been significant. And were you involved a lot at that point? I was quite involved in private conversations. I stopped being involved in public conversations because it seemed to me that there wasn't much more for me publicly to say. You know, we, we'd explained why we should do this. So I was involved in quite a lot of private conversations and I went on <coughs> doing some presentations but not on the same scale publicly. Uh, I think that, that sense of the post-launch period being very important is something I hadn't understood, and I think that's, that's something to reflect on. Um, so that's all I want to say. We were, you know, it now looks as though it's going to happen in some sort of a way. We were lucky. There was ripe time. We started at the right time in the electoral cycle. Um, starting very early in a parliament seems to, you know, if, if somebody else was ever asked to do something <coughs> like this, that would be one of my key pieces of advice. Make sure it's early in the parliament. Uh, the role of the stakeholder community was essential. In the end, it was all politics. Mm. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Norman. Um, I won't go over the same points that Andrew's made, with which I totally agree. Um, all I would add is that, um, with typical modesty, Andrew has understated his role as an extremely effective chairman. Now, he only had two of us to keep under control, it is true, but I don't mean by it's that. Quite enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, the way he put himself about, um, I mean, was remarkable because what he did was he engaged with all these stakeholders, many of whom wanted something done but didn't necessarily agree with each other as to what, it, what should be done. So we shouldn't assume that um, the stakeholder community were a homogenous group. They could be, on some issues, a pretty disparate group, as Paul no doubt found as a minister. So you, you, he, he actually managed to keep this um, group of people roughly focused on some key issues and not go down lots of highways and byways. I think the Commission benefited um, from having three people who are can master detail but are not what I would call detail obsessives. I mean, we, there, there were lots of interesting highways and byways we could have gone charging down and had an extremely entertaining time, but we, we, we collectively resisted that temptation and we stayed <coughs> focused. I've got three or four points around some two, three or four headings. Environment, commission remit, commission process and post-match analysis, as the footballers say. I mean, I think we were lucky <coughs> that it was a long-standing problem, which was then going to be tackled at the right point in the political cycle, where I think a degree of exhaustion had set in amongst all the players. So um, I wouldn't say that they were happy for us to produce anything, but they were deeply re relieved that we could produce something <coughs> which was halfway decent and respectable. And so there, w there were lots and lots of people who didn't want to keep going around this track. And, and actually, so there was a lot of goodwill towards the Commission uh, when we came on the scene. The whole area had been analysed to death. I mean, there was no shortage of material around that you could 
you could pick through and find. You didn't have to do a lot of new fact-finding and analysis. I'm not saying the data was all perfect, but there was a lot of stuff you could mine mm -hmm. and actually get your policy. Um. And in some ways, um, I just go back to how I was appointed. Well, I was appointed in effect. I, was, I don't think I'm breaching any confidence. This guy to the right of me sounded me out. Um, we had an interesting discussion about whether the commission was going to be three people or five people. So I knew these guys were in the right place. when the, that's the, uh, That was the conversation one was having. So that we, we were not going to have a commission of 20 people representative of particular interest. Because that would have been death. If we'd have had a big commission with representative of particular et issues, that would not have produced anything like the kind of report that we, we produced. Um, and the good guys, I think it slightly pains me to say this, in, um, the good guys in all this were the Liberal Democrats. Before they were in a sensible position before the election, <coughs> while, while Andy Burnham and Andrew Lansley were uh, sort of uh, kicking chunks out of each other, uh, Norman Lamb was sat in a sensible position, well, why don't we have an independent commission look at it? Um, so. And they, they got on with that as part of a coalition agreement. So you could argue that coalition government has actually been quite important in actually making progress on this. There hasn't been much written about, but they, they, they had actually got to a more sensible position mm -hmm. than the other two main parties before the 2010 election. I think it was important that we had a narrow remit um, and uh, it had its weaknesses because some of us would dearly have loved, and Andrew always kept me under control, would have dearly loved us to go off down the NHS route and integration and so forth. He was quite right not to. Did manage to get a few bits about the NHS into the report, but uh, <laughs> essentially um, we, we, we stuck to the knitting. We stuck to the remit that we'd been given and the remit was not that wide. And we were... Uh, served by a good young team, not that big, who managed for the most part to leave their departmental backgrounds at the door when they came in to di discuss with the Commission. That is very important. If you're going to have a cross white, and I say this as an old Whitehall warrior, if you're going to have a cross departmental team on some body like this, uh, I'd always go for younger people <coughs> who haven't got as much baggage, departmental baggage with them, um, and being very clear that they're there to serve this commission, not to represent the department of X or Y. And that they didn't spend their time. Uh, they could go back to their departments and listen to the voices, but they didn't come along to the commission and say, <gasps> Well, Chairman, I don't think uh, the DCLG would actually put up with that, Chairman. No, I don't think we can go that far. And we didn't have any of that at all. Mm. And I've been around Whitehall long enough to know that that is available in spades uh, for lots of outside bodies. Um, I think the short time scale was important. I mean, it was very clear we had a year to do the work. That was it. We weren't <laughs> expected to carry on like a Royal Commission for forever and the day. And the small discussion, as, as the small commission, it, it was important. I think we did spend a lot of time, but I just want to emphasise again the point Andrew has made. Working out what problem it is that you're trying to solve is time well spent. And being able then to describe that problem with some words which have some resonance um, with a lot of people is, is actually important. And too many bodies set off at a gallop without deciding what is the end point they, they want, want to reach. And I think it was well worth, and Andrew was extremely good, and he endlessly talked about, to many of the stakeholders, who looked a bit mystified at the beginning, he talked about this being essentially an insurance against risk problem. That, and that actually, no one had really talked about this problem in those terms. Um, so it wasn't about service delivery, it wasn't, it was actually, in, in some ways it was going back to beverage. What are the risks you're trying to, to cope with? And that's, that was, I think, 
and a very, very important insight. And it was why we were able, I think, at the end of the day, to write quite a short report and not have tomes and tomes. And we, uh, we actually did have an, an analysis and expend it and, uh, uh, and uh, analysis and uh, data um, uh, appendix. But we kept all that, a lot of that stuff out of <coughs> the main report. So it was, a, it was a short, simple report where people could see what the main strategic issues were. Um, Post-match analysis, how did we keep it alive? Well, I think many of us thought it would die. I mean, I have to say, uh, at the end of the first six to nine months afterwards, <laughs> despite all Andrew's efforts, I thought it was going to die. It felt as though it was going to die. And I think partly why it didn't die was there were enough of us who kept making a nuisance of ourselves. We, we would you know, put <coughs> questions down in the House of Lords or we put questions in the Commons or people would make speeches at conference. The voluntary sector put themselves about. They kept on going. And I think one of the, in a sense, what happened after the report, people took to enough of the report to think it was worthwhile carrying on running with the ball. I mean, that, and that's quite... I mean, if you see a lot of big, tome, Royal Commission-type reports, there aren't some key messages that people are able to carry on running with the ball with. And I think we did a good enough job in the main report to give some concepts that people could keep parading and it was, they, those concepts were easy enough for the media to cover them as well. They were, it wasn't so complicated. Although it was, in one way, a, a complicated problem, I think the potential solutions could be written about by journalists, even in tabloids, in, in a reasonably sensible way. So that... And I think, in a way, we also tried not to be <coughs> over-prescriptive about the detail. And that... <coughs> we, 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 I would say, I talk about a deal not architecture. And I think we produced an architecture and some, uh, some housing plans without showing what all the internal finishes of the lounge and the kitchen, etc., would be. Mm. And that's, again, I think, quite an important. There was quite a lot for the government to be able to negotiate around with in interested parties on the detail of how you'd actually implement it. And that, I think, is... And there were, there were fewer detailed points for the, the critics to actually get onto and actually pick it apart. Um, on the whole, you, took, you either took the architecture or you didn't take the architecture. Um, you couldn't say, well, it's all right, but really the way they're planning that, the kitchen or the bathroom is really appalling. They co that couldn't be done, I think, with our report. You either took it as a whole uh, and accepted or rejected it. So I think that's a, that's a lot, Nick. Great, great. Can I ask one question before I come to Michelle? You, you were the only politician, so to speak, on the Commission, although, and you were Labour. Was that an important part of the construct? I mean, were you there to get Labour on side, or were you as well as being a commissioner? Or were well, you I think you, you should ask Andy Burnham whether he thinks I was there no, to get no, Labour on yeah, side. No. I mean, I, mean I, had, I did have form on this yeah. uh, um, um, in terms of putting together a coalition in the Lords with David Lipsy to stop the balmy brown plan for a national care service and free care. So I think my credentials with the non-Labour Party uh, parties were probably higher than my credentials with the <laughs> Labour Party, actually. So I, I think it was useful. If you can find people who are, who are reasonably non-partisan, mm. I, th I, hope, I, I hope I was useful to Andrew and Joe in being able to see the world through the prism of how politicians would look at some of these issues. Mm. It wasn't that I, was I, I had some Labour cause or any other cause to peddle. It was merely a perspective about how politics would play out on yeah. some of these issues. I think that was the. You know, it, it seemed to me it was very important to have some. Well, it was very attractive to have somebody with ministerial experience on the commission, and it clearly couldn't be somebody who was 
who was in the, cu the current governing party, that yeah, would be most yeah. peculiar because it was mm. so. So it, it was almost it was important that we had a minister or an ex-minister. Mm. It was important that it was somebody who wasn't a member of the governing party because it was an independent commission. Uh, if we'd been a multi-party, mm. so, so yeah, and it was, and, and that was. It was very helpful to have that perspective because it wasn't a perspective I've ever had. I've never sat on the inside of these things, and that was a very important thing yeah. to have. Great. For sure. Well, the way in which it's been described so far, I think, doesn't reveal the incredible twists and turns that really happened. It had <laughs> more twists and turns than a few dead bodies in a good Agatha Christie novel. Uh, so <coughs> I, I'll try and keep to the understatement, but I, I, I don't know if I can manage it for the whole 10 minutes. Um, history really matters. And it, um, why I'll start with that is, I think the sector as a whole was pretty tired after the last Labour government and deflated by attempting for several years to get significant progress on social care. I think that's an important factor. The challenges we face as a sector, many of them still remain. One is people think social care is free. They think they'll have it at the point of need, like the NHS, and get very, very angry when they realise that's not the case. Even in recent polling, when you say to people social care, they think you mean children in care homes. Mm. People don't realise uh, we're talking about social care and what it means. You often receive social care at a point in which you're experiencing significant deterioration or a crisis. Despite millions of people being affected by it, there isn't a mass movement out there of people who want to rise up and demand something better. The sector itself was relatively fragmented, I think, under Labour, and uh, was busily pushing forward very similar proposals, but hadn't formed a united front. And the issue of care is very, very wrapped up in the issue of how you pay for care. And we know that is a very politically sensitive issue with still the vast majority of people saying they think social care should be free. So really important challenges, but critically important to learn some of the lessons then when you think new government, how do we get progress on this issue? I would agree with Norman, the coalition was a very, very important factor. My understanding is that the Lib Dems used it as a point of negotiation in the coalition agreement. That was critical in getting the commitment to a commission. I think the second point was, uh, as a sector, thinking, well, how do we make a difference? One is we have to create enough political pressure and enough consistent political pressure for the politicians to respond in a way that we had not done historically. We also needed to create a space where the politicians felt that whilst they may not win votes from it, because the evidence was never there that it was a vote winner, it was never there when you look at the polling, they wouldn't lose votes as a result of going for this. Third issue is creating mass mobilisation and particularly working for Age UK, engaging and involving older people and our organisations up and down the country in describing and articulating what good care is and having an open debate and sensitising people to the issue of paying for care. Getting a sector to unite and the Care and Support Alliance became a very critical body in that so that we came together at crucial periods to ensure that we spoke with one voice. Now, in terms of the commission, the commission was never the whole question, the whole strategy, and I'll come on to that in a second, but the commission played an incredibly important role. The sector was tired. Perhaps the policy thinking hadn't developed in a number of years, if I were to be honest. And the Commission provided a really important timetable within the political cycle that politicians had to respond to. And that enabled us to also have key campaigns, 
public affairs activity, media activity to coincide with those critical decisions. <coughs> I think Andrew himself brought a huge amount to the process, both in terms of his expertise, uh, his brilliant engagement with the stakeholder sector, and the trust that he got virtually within weeks of starting. So there's an incredible issue around personal credibility and trust. I think the other thing was having Paul as the Minister for Social Care, who had worked with many people in the sector for years, and people trusted him and his belief and desire to do good in this area. And that provided an awful lot of goodwill. <coughs> the Secretariat was strong and clearly independent. There was strong leadership within the Department of Health, particularly David Behan, Sean Gallagher, Sally Warren formed an excellent team who you know and uh, knew you could work closely with and have trusted and respected relationships. And Andrew, can, Andrew I think, prepared the political environment very well. So the good Heineken phrase is, you know, he reached parts the voluntary sector certainly couldn't reach in a way that the voluntary sector couldn't do. But it also, uh, I think, threw back a challenge and made us, as a sector, think <coughs> very carefully about our evidence, our economic analysis, the underpinning assumptions of our policy positions, and made <coughs> us get better at what we do, because you framed the issue in a way that nobody else had really thought about, and I think a lot of people learnt from that. But it's very difficult, you know, being as DG of Age UK at that time, you want to be careful that you're not going down the wrong route. You're not selling yourself too short or the people that you're there to represent too short. So my strategy, talking personally, and I think the sector as a whole uh, also shared this, was I had two objectives. One was to um, illuminate the state of social care and the crisis within social care within England at the time. And to do that in an incredibly evidence-based way, which made the remit and the air war that the Commission was operating in much broader than the question of how you pay. The second was, uh, first question, what does good look like? How do we get it? How do you create momentum to ensure that there's political movement on it? The second question of how you pay for it was having an open and honest debate with all the key stakeholders about whether this was doable or not. Could there be a compromise around moving away from a universal system? And I think we felt in all honesty it was the only game in town. Now I had two strategies and they came under incredible amounts of pressure at time. One was not to step back from the argument around the underfunding of social care. So not, not the people here on this panel, but I was put under extreme pressure to drop the argument about the crisis in care and the broader question about change. By, we, by whom? Uh, senior people within government. Uh, very senior people within government. Um, and the trade-off... <laughs> The trade-off that I was presented with is you won't get Dilnot if you, if you continue to put pressure uh, on us about the crisis in care. You're being naive. So I'm generally not a naive person. I knew it's a central part of the strategy because once the commission was over, the argument and the debate goes on because we certainly don't have a fantastically functioning social care system in this country. But that was a very, very fine balance to, to uh, uh, manage. And the support of politicians, journalists, particularly uh, Daniels here from the Mail, the Telegraph, all of whom had reach into the Conservative part of the coalition was absolutely critical in what at one point came nearly daily coverage on social care. I mean, we were in the press having events, producing research, mobilising individuals, running campaigns continuously publicly. And there was a huge amount of activity going on uh, privately as well. The second issue was um, 
how you pay for it and do you get support amongst the sector for the Dilnot Commission recommendations. So I think our plan was to resist the calls to back off up until about four or five months before we got the final decision on Dilnot. And if you look closely at the sector's response during that period, and it was no mean feat for 60 organisations to decide on this prioritisation of messaging, we pulled back on the crisis and care and we really threw our weight behind the Dilnot recommendations. And the reason we did that is because we strongly believed it wasn't an either or. The political processes and the funding processes within government were different. We were not going to get additional funding within that CSR, but we could get uh, funding for uh, the Dilnot recommendations. And that we would continue the fight for broader reform and funding for social care once we'd landed that success. Now, we did that. Uh, I think we pretty quickly bagged it in, people sometimes say, the Sinn Féin School of Negotiation. We accepted it, and the next day, I think, I was uh, writing about the crisis in care again. So it was a bit <laughs> naughty. No, I think it was a few, a few weeks afterwards, because um, you do want to give that amount of time for the success and the thank you. Um, but that, that was absolutely critical, the timing and the ability of the sector to be very, very mature about it. It wasn't uncontroversial to do that, um, but I think people were very, very disciplined in how they approached it. In terms of the lessons learnt, um, for me, it's interesting you talk about creating an, an architecture for Dilnot. But the, the period after the Commission effectively stood down, and Andrew talked about the six months or so where you were very involved, a bit after that, so I think there was two or three months, where it really did feel dead in the water. And at that point, like any campaign, there's only usually a few people left standing. Uh, and the people left standing were absolutely critical in not giving up hope. Uh, and, and at that point, playing really quite sophisticated influencing and campaigning, targeted on a very, very, very small number of people. And there, I think, um, what was important was the trust that a number of key players and very senior people had in um, a number of individuals within the sector, that you could have proper discussions <coughs> Uh, and negotiations and understand the positions and influence them as they were taking place within government. But it did feel very lonely and so one of the lessons would be post-commission it felt all that expertise that had been gathered by the commission was still being used informally but was very much needed both in terms of a rallying point but there are several issues around implementation which are absolutely critical in making these proposals a success. So in conclusion, from my perspective, the Commission was an incredibly important point <coughs> in the political cycle, <coughs> which was expertly led by Andrew, and Andrew's role in that is critical and you can't understate it, that the sector <coughs> as a whole recognised its weakness, raised its gain, and mobilised effectively with the support of a number of critical journalists, politicians, and opinion formers. And that whilst it doesn't solve the issue of social care, it's a really important step in beginning to build a stronger social care system. And we know that's continuing with the legislation and there will be ongoing debates and discussion about funding and the funding of social care as we move towards the next election. Michelle, that's great. Paul, you were there at the beginning and they're pretty much at the end. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, um, well, the end has not arrived yet. No. Of course. There's a lot <laughs> more uh, to happen yet. Um, and that's why I think, I mean, whilst this sort of conversation today is, is, is good to have and it's... I think sort of there's a degree of candour, but there will be things probably in five years' time that people will feel more happy to talk about. 
uh, you know, it's a bit like the BBC Radio 4 with a reunion sort of type format. And uh, I think you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a better version of the programme in, in five years' time in terms of some of the nuances of this. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I'd been around these issues uh, from, from an opposition uh, back bench and front bench point of view for, for the best part of 15 years. I've watched the, the Royal Commission uh, go through its uh, travails and uh, the way in which the last government had handled that. Um, and when the opportunity presented itself of coalition uh, and because of the uh, position that Norman had taken in the run-up to the general election of there should be an independent process, we had if you like, a very simple mechanism to drive forward uh, some change in this area. And I think one of the things that's worth just saying is that this, this is an area of public policy that's been in the too difficult to do draw. Uh, and every time it's taken out and looked at, uh, politicians and senior civil servants say, no, it's still too difficult to do, put it back in the drawer. Uh, and it, it's never the right time. Whether it's a time of plenty or whether it's a time of austerity, it's never the right time to do this. We should just kick the can down the road. It's a phrase that I heard a few times during the uh, uh, discussions over the last few years. So one of the things I was very clear about very early on and coming into the department is practically the first thing I started talking to people about uh, and people outside who'd been through this series of attempts of the past. What were the lessons of why it didn't succeed previously? And one of the lessons was that uh, a Royal Commission, too big, too many different interests on there, didn't work because it was just unable to deliver a consensus. Keep the group small uh, and focused. And we have done that, we did that. Um, and, and don't build in mission creep. Don't allow it to become something which it's not intended to be. Make sure it stays focused on, on the key question. Um, but at the same time, we also had, alongside the, the need to address this question of who pays for care, the, the question of we don't have a system that's fit for purpose in the first place, the overall system of social care in this country. We have outdated legislation um, and uh, issues about funding as well, of course. So what can we do to address in a comprehensive way? So framing this in the context of a comprehensive reform was important. I think it was important in terms of building confidence and, and building the relationships in the sector. Um, and of course we had a, a purpose-made vehicle, we had the Law Commission work that was going on, government had to take its view about each aspect of that, but that was a very important part of the dialogue that was going on all the way through this. Um, yes, the, uh, even getting the terms of reference signed off across government was uh, an interesting experience, um, one might even say tricky. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to start this process before the summer recess. And I think that the fact we were able to do that meant that we gave this commission and the whole process the biggest possible opportunity of succeeding. You know, it, it would have been very easy for this to have been kicked into the autumn and then spending reviews and, and probably never then have surfaced into, into a process at all. Uh, getting the right people on the on the commission was absolutely crucial. We needed fresh eyes um, and we needed big brains uh, involved in this process, particularly on the economics, particularly on the economics. Uh, one of the, I think, continual blocks to change in this area has been an orthodox view from the Treasury about this issue, about, well, if you've got assets, why don't you use them yourself to pay for your care? Uh, pretty hard but nonetheless part of the thinking that's pervaded this debate for a very long time. So we actually needed someone who could provide rigour in those debates about the economics of this. And I think with uh, Andrew we had that, uh, and also that rigour around framing the question. But we also needed insight uh, in the sector, and I think both Joe and Norman gave us that. And we definitely needed insight into, if you like, the ways of the corridors uh, of Whitehall. And Norman gave us that, and that was why it was important that he was there. Um, I don't think any of us thought that Norman was going to bring uh, the Labour Party to the table in that sense, but I think it was important that we had that insight uh, in, inside the Commission. Um, the plans were shared with government ahead of their publication in July. There were internal cross-government discussions about those. Um, I think if we had had a majority government, it's questionable whether there would have been a process in the first place. I think had we had a majority government and they had started the process, 
that would have been the point at which it would have been terminated. It would have been still born in July 2011 had we had majority government. I think uh, one of the disruptive, in a good way, elements of coalition is it means the normal ways of doing business do get disrupted and do allow things that wouldn't normally be accepted to be reconsidered. And I think we've seen that in this particular policy uh, area. I think it allowed it to, uh, to go further than probably any previous attempt. Um, so from July 2011 to, to March 2013, uh, a very, very, very long time, and it feels like far more than the uh, actual chronological period of time that I'm talking about, um, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, across the road between the Department of Health, uh, the Treasury, the number 10, uh, there were a series of quad discussions um, and I think the strategic goal that, that those of us who were advocating for this policy because we saw it as being a practicable and deliverable solution was to keep the plane in the air despite lots of people shooting at it and trying to crash it, um, both outside and inside government. Um, and the longer we kept it in the air, and this metaphor does begin to break down after a while <laughs> in terms of fuel, uh, but let's just assume this plane is powered by some uh, green energy that is forever sustainable, as long as it was kept in the air, I think the harder it became for it to just be allowed to crash, it had to be landed safely and delivered. And that, that, that was part, if you like, of just keeping it alive. Uh, I think there are probably people in government even now who don't quite, can't quite believe it did stay alive, but it, it did stay alive, uh, and I pay a lot of um, respect to both the strategic nature of the way in which the sector made the case, the very effective way in which Andrew and others uh, did their bit, and some of the incredible heavy lifting that civil servants did uh, in terms of supporting that process. Um, I think that the uh, kerfuffles that took place in, in the summer of 2012 were very interesting. Uh, I was fascinated to read the stories over the summer, um, and uh, I'll say more about that in a few years' time. But what I would say now is that um, I think what the reporting over the summer did was partly get at what was going on, but not all of it. And there was clearly uh, reflection and decision being made during that period, which did lead ultimately to the uh, midterm review announcements. Uh, that led ultimately to the announcements in the March of 2013. Um, but of course at that point we had a reshuffle uh, and I found myself uh, uh, with my box uh, uh, of uh, uh, stuff from my office uh, back in the House of Commons and actually that was quite a useful opportunity because uh, I left with a good deal of understanding and insight as to what was going on um, but wanted to deploy that as best as I could to try and make sure the policy landed. So uh, that was one of the reasons that I, I wrote the piece that I did for The Telegraph, published some articles and worked with Centre Forum and so on, just to try and keep this in the air and, and keep this, uh, uh, this whole thing going. So what have we, what have we uh, I probably should just make some comment on the cross-party talks. Mm. When you're trying to keep a plane up in the air, and there is a discussion going on about whether or not you want this just to crash and go away or whether you want it to land safely inside government, it's quite difficult to have a meaningful and constructive and fully disclosing discussion with another party. You know? and, and that's where we were. We weren't able to have those discussions at the level I think I would have liked us to have been able to have, and I regret that, um, but it was just the reality of where we were. And I, from my point of view, that was less important than actually securing the policy. So securing the policy had to be the priority uh, in terms of the, the internal coalition politics. Um, so what have we done? Well, I think we've done some really rather important things here. First, we've got a government for the first time ever to accept that the state has a legal obligation, an obligation to deal with the tail end costs of care. That's never happened before. That's a huge shift in public policy in this country. Um, secondly, we have an architecture. An architecture means that you can make different decisions about, as uh, Norman was saying, the design of the kitchen, the colour of the wallpaper and other aspects of the internal design. And that, that flexibility going forward, I'm sure, will be exploited by future governments to deliver their own goals. But at the same time, key principles will have been established. 
And for me, one of the big opportunities that I still think is not yet fully grasped and needs to be is the fact that what this set of proposals, when implemented, will do is it will bring into a relationship with local authorities a very large number of people who hitherto had no need to and no desire to be anywhere near the local council when it comes to social care. Why is that important? It's important because it allows some discussions that are about public health interventions, about ageing better in place in your own home and so on. And it also uh, allows for a more sensible conversation about how you do deliver an integration agenda. Because at the moment we have a whole population of people who are self-funding for whom integration is a meaningless concept because they're not funding, they're funding their own arrangements, they're not part of the system. We seem to forget that. This allows for the first time us to plan in a way that does allow us to deliver an integrated approach, whether you're paying for your own care or whether you're uh, being paid for by someone else. Um, and there are wider changes, which I think it's just worth making clear about now as well. One is the new legislation will put well-being at the heart of the way the system works. That's a very profound change in the system. Prevention is in the legislation. And I think, again, understated, but should be now really hammered home, parity. Parity of esteem between the person that's being cared for and the carer. It's a big legal shift in, in the way in which the system will work. So what about the challenges? Um, there are challenges around implementation. Um, this has got to be landed in 150 local authorities on the same day to the same standard and that's a big challenge. I think that the, the new DG at the department has got a good grip on that. I think there's some very good, good work being done, not least the fact that the co-productive approach that we've taken throughout is being reflected in implementation as well. There's a combined team from local government and the department working on implementation. I think that's very smart. I think it's a good way of ensuring maximum buy-in and also maximum understanding of the complexities of implementation at a local level. Uh, but we need to manage the queue there are 430,000 people who are self-funders now who will be hammering on town hall doors as this system becomes more widely understood it's coming online. And the last thing I think local government is going to want is for them all to be arriving uh, on the 1st of April 2016. And I think there are still some issues about how that queue is managed and how uh, those people are, are, are properly supported. Uh, and I think just last week, there was a big spat in the House of Lords over one aspect of the deferred payment arrangements, which really rather illuminates the need for a very big endeavour around awareness raising. It's back to Michelle's point, really, about the anger people feel when they find out this system is not a free system. It's very real and will become even more so. And indeed, some of the reporting of these changes have portrayed it as if uh, a, this nasty government is going to impose uh, a £72,000 uh, tax on you for your care uh, when of course that's not what's happening but it's given people the impression that they're moving from something that was free to something that's now going to cost them £72,000 uh, and getting those things across in a way that makes it clearer is going to be very important not least the difference between actual costs and notional contributions by local authorities getting that across is going to be important my final point on challenges is there will be people who will not like the answer they get from their council there are now, and there will be even more of them, and they will be more able, financially and in other ways, to challenge the decisions. We need a mechanism that's more robust than just simply a complaints process to deal with that. So, after a decade of having constantly asked the question, how do we fix this, um, and what do we do to fix it, we're now into a very different piece of landscape. It's the landscape of how do we implement this, how quickly can we do it, can we do it well, uh, and I think that that is a big, big win uh, for a process that came out of a coalition. Um, and um, I just end by saying thank you very much again to, to Andrew and the commissioners for their work. I think the leadership was critical and the sector for its discipline. I think those two things together have allowed a long-term and quite profound change to be secured in a system that is very often biased to short-term. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, questions? I've got loads of them, yeah. but I'm sure you have too. Um, there will be a microphone. There is a microphone. There is a microphone. And could you just say who you are when you ask a question? Start at the very back there. Uh, um, uh, Peter Riddle, Director of the IFG. Could, can I go back to the, in a sense, the title, Policy by Review, and ask Andrew this? That 
Um, it's clearly that after the problems with the Sutherland Royal Commission, the size of it uh, and all the difficulties there, uh, you know, as Paul said, different model used three people. Um, what examples did you look to? Because every time this was a commission, it's almost reinvented by the chair and the secretariat. Did you look to any particular models to think of how you do it within the time scale you'd have? And the corollary to that is, what other areas do you think this particular approach, which was very focused, wasn't as sprawling as Sutherland was, very focused, this uh, type of policy issues this could be applied to? Given in some other countries, we had, we had the former head of the Australian Productivity Commission in the Institute um, a few weeks ago talking about their model. Um, comment, please. Thank you. So uh, what other examples did I look to? Well, I, I sat on a whole range of these sorts of things myself, never anything of the... Uh, and I had a strong sense that the larger they were, the less effective they were. That really, if you want, if you want to make something work, then it has to be relatively small. Unless it's a, uh, so I look back to the Royal Commission on Distribution of Income and Wealth more decades ago than I care to remember, and that was actually that was trying to scope something. That was a, it's a different kind of it. But if you're if you're trying to tackle a problem, then you want a small number of people to do it. It was clear at the stage when I was first involved that. I, when I was, uh, probably not fair to ask Sally this, or would be fair to ask Paul this, it looked to me when I first became involved as though the Turner, the Turner Commission had, was thought of as a kind of, in some senses, cognate, and that had also been pretty small, I was aware of that, so, so that, seemed, that seemed very important. What other issues might something like this be appropriate for? Well, I think that the character of this was that it was a clear problem. Or there was a pr it wasn't clear what the problem was, but the, it was a it was a bounded problem. It was social care. So you know, would this be an appropriate way, for example, of dealing with the health service? I'm not sure because I don't think the health you know the health service is all you know, kind of whole whole wide range of issues. What we were asked to do was look at the way in which the funding of social care should work, and in particular how it should be split between. Mm -hmm. The, st the individual and the state. So it was a really quite narrowly defined problem. I think for a narrowly defined problem, you want a small number of people, you need to tell them to go and get on with it and work out what the answer is. So I think for narrowly defined problems, this is the right thing. For broader sets of issues, I'm not sure. Not least because I think one of the things we learned was that even, w even in this very narrow issue, in the end, it was up to politicians to make the final decision. As you broad If you were to broaden the question out, then the extent to which you could actually expect an independent commission to come up with anything that was really going to be very useful when so much of it was going to have to be decided by, by politicians, I'm not sure. Uh, given that the subject matter uh, of your work had a lot to do with the local property, the delivery of care, is it in any way remarkable that none of you can be said to be, and I know you've dealt with the representation point, but to be representative have any particular interest in, have any particular experience of local government, which will be in the frame, whatever, it w would have been in the frame, whatever your recommendations might have been. David, I had six years in local government. The director, of social, service. director of social services. And so did Joe Williams. How many years ago? I mean, I'm not in a wrong, but I'm a bit... No, no, but I mean, we have... I mean, it's not, I think I'm trying to make that sort of side, but I mean, the structural place of local government Well, there were two. But it, I mean, it, I mean, it, uh, yeah, I can sit because you know I was there when we were to work. A crucial part of the characteristics. Of, so, uh, I won't be too disclosed. There was a list of people who might be on the commission, and one of the key characteristics of that group was high-level, genuine experience in actual delivery of this at the local mm. level. And Norman, Norman is the ex-head of social services for Kent. And so was Joe in Cheshire. And Joe had been, you know, so so it was it was absolutely in our minds. Uh, it's also important to note that one of the people on the Secretariat was drawn from DCLG specifically to, to have that in mind. And I mean, I had, I, we had meetings with many, many people, but I had several meetings with Bob Kerslake. And I, so so we, were, we were actually closely tied into DCLG throughout the whole process. Paul, do you want to? Just very, very briefly, one, I'd had 16 years' experience as a, as a councillor on a majority group. Uh, in Sutton, and that was a useful set of insights which I brought into the role. And secondly, I think in the, in in those two three years, the, certainly those first two years, of the department when I was there, quite a lot of work was done by David Beam and others to really engage. I think quite 
differently with local government as part of the work preparatory for the health reforms, but also as part of the work preparatory <coughs> for, the, uh, for the social care reforms. So I think that, that was another piece of this, this puzzle to try and make sure that, uh, that that dimension was not being overlooked. Uh, there was a question behind where David was. Thank you. I'm, I'm Sebastian Habibi. I'm from the bit of the Department of Health that's leading on implementing uh, the recommendations <laughs> of, of the Commission. Uh, so lucky me. Surprised you've got time to be here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't miss it. I am sorry I was late. Um, it's just this pick about this point about public communications. We're not at the end yet, um, and public messaging and public support is, is crucial, isn't it? Particularly, as, of course, because there's going to be another election before we do reach the end. Um, people tell me, as I engage in this up and down the country, sometimes that the cap is not a cap. That is often the accusation, that we're misleading people because the cap is not a cap. It's 72,000, but it won't be by the time they reach it. And by the time they reach it, they'll still be paying, which, of course, is all true, factually. Um, <coughs> the Deal Not Report, if I may call it that, uses the language of cap. The shorthand for this is sometimes the cap cost system. The panel has hardly used at all the word cap this afternoon. Are we implying or are we subconsciously saying that we need a change of narrative here? Um, and that if we continue to use the, 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 the terms cap and the concept of cap, we will be in danger of misleading the public. I'd be grateful for your advice. <laughs> I mean, I think we, um, we've not talked about the cap because we haven't been talking about the policy, we've been talking about the process, and that's really what it's about. Yeah. The, today is about yeah. the process. Yeah. Um, but your question is not irrelevant to the process because we thought very carefully about this. I mean, we had, we had many, many conversations uh, about this as we went through. And, and I think in our report, we're very careful, very careful to describe exactly what we mean by it. So I, I, mean, I think my feeling is, no, it's not, mis as long as the context is set appropriately, it's not misleading. Uh, it, it is what it is, and I think it's a, a fair way of describing it. Of course, there are, there are unfair ways of describing it, uh, and it's not... You know, so it's a particular thing. Other people might have wanted a different thing, but no. So I, I think as long as it's carefully and appropriately described, and as long as we continue to have the support they've been from the stakeholder community. The stakeholder community has been extremely clear about this all along. Actually, the media have, by and large, tried to represent this well, there's always a difficulty that we've got you know, a subset of the media who, who are expert in this and so who are clear about this. And then some of the coverage has come from political journalists who are unlikely to be expert in this and there's a risk of misleading. But no, I, I, I don't think there's a need to change the narrative. Could I just add something to that? I mean, there's a much bigger issue, Sebastian, which we were very clear about and we couldn't crack that in the, in the year which is a public awareness campaign. We only made 10 recommendations, and one of them was about a major uh, public awareness campaign. Now, a public awareness campaign requires the government, and not just the Department of Health, the government, to think of ways of communicating these messages. It's not a narrow issue about is a cap, not a cap. It's actually how you get across the messages about what the responsibility of the citizen is and what the, right, what the responsibility of the state is in paying for care and support. And that is a big, long journey that actually the government across departments has to go on. And actually, it's interesting in the debates in the House of Lords, there have been moves to put on the face of the bill the responsibility for get, engaging with that awareness campaign, which is a very unusual thing for parliamentarians to do. Questions? One down the front here. Quite a, uh, Just wait, wait one second for the mic. Uh, quite a related question, actually. Uh, Dario Kuznetsov from Big Society Capital. Both uh, Michelle and Paul discussed this kind of tension between public expectation and the reality. And I'm wondering if you think the implementation of some of the recommendations and the language about entitlement will actually be contradictory to some of the government's push for efficiency savings and driving down the costs of care and you know, all of those reductions. Yeah, Can I, I don't know if anyone wants to pick that up. We're, we're quite keen to keep on the process rather than, yeah. rather I mean, than well the merits maybe, of Maybe try and give an answer which partly answers that but also is about the process then, yeah. which is to say that I think, again, it comes to 
to, to, to land the implementation of the policy, we have to get to a position where a much larger proportion of the population than currently understand what the current arrangements are and what the new ones are going to be. Because unless you do that, I think the execution of the policy could be still severely damaged by public anger at what they will perceive as being something that is less than what they have now. So it's really very important that a lot of time is spent explaining that. And then after that has been done, over time, the, other, the big gain potentially of this change is engaging people at an earlier stage with planning and preparing for care needs. And, 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 and I think that that's, that's an understated gain, I think, up until now. But I think it really needs to be <coughs> forefront to people's thinking. How do we use this change as a trigger for behaviour change? Because that's how you address some of the wider funding challenges as well around demand and need for care. And this does have to be about that as well. And at this point, people still feel and think the majority of people think it's free. Mm. Yeah. They're angry because they think they're going to have to pay £72,000. Yeah. Um, there was a hand over there. Yes. Uh, just work, just one, can I ask one question while that's coming along? You mentioned negotiation in terms of reference within government. Uh, was there any negotiation between government and Andrew about what the terms of reference should be? You know, because sometimes you get the chance to have a go at that. And secondly, although it was about funding, you were not asked to, and you did not, say how the money, the extra money, should be found. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? There was no, there was no negotiation in terms of terms reference. reference. Terms of reference had been agreed by Cabinet before I took them on. There was one particular bit of that I can't remember what it was. It wasn't very important that I wasn't very happy with. And, um, but actually, it, just, it's, it's a, it simply wasn't worth it. Um, there was no, and it's worth saying that at no point throughout the process were Norman Joe or I subjected to any political pressure at all from inside or outside government. I mean, there was absolutely none of that. I mean, I think, I you know, <laughs> um, you know, completely not. And had we been, then I, we would have said so in public, and, I, and if it had continued, I would have resigned. But there was none. There was absolutely none. Um, we would have been off. I mean, I mean, in fact, absolutely seriously. I mean, I, I certainly would have been off. If people had started to tell me how I thought the outcome should be, I would have been off. Yeah. And so that would have been down to two. And Andrew would have been off, so Joe would have been left on the road. But we weren't. I mean, it was, we yeah. were completely... We, were, we simply weren't subjective. Um, then the other question, was it right not to, not to describe where we thought the money should come from? In my view, absolutely. Uh, and maybe that's too many years at the IFS, but, you know... I, the idea of hypothec you know, hypothecation, it, it just simply, it, 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 the whole question of where the money should come from seemed to me absolutely inescapably one for government. Mm. And the only merit of our having said, had said something would have been if it would have made things easier for government. But that was not a game that I think any of us want, you know, we, we didn't see ourselves as in the game of making political decisions easier for government, you know. It's tough being a minister, but you know, they choose it. So I'm, I'm absolutely, <laughs> had we, had we produced in our, in our final report said, and we think the money should come from, you know, an increase in the basic rate of income tax and mm. cut in mm. spending on this, a reduction winter in the, fuel. the, yeah. the, the, the yeah, it's a winter yeah. fuel reduction in the mm. lump sum for pension, it, 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 it's not what we were being asked to do. Mm. It would have, I don't think it would have had any real merit or credibility. I don't, we would have felt comfortable. And, well, well look, just questions. look at what happened after we published our report and when some of us re-entered the political arena and started, when asked by journalists and others mm. how we would have paid for it, mm. I started talking about um, uh, free bus passes, etc., etc., and a storm <coughs> came down. Now, if we'd have said any mm. of that in the report, we'd have been dead, probably, mm. on the day of publication. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that's, that's the point. I think if, if there had been a surfacing in, in the Commission's report of the options for how to pay for mm. it, that would have guaranteed it would have been dead then. Yeah. Because yeah, the story would have been all, as much all about that. Would have been, all that would have got out yeah. would have been, this is the thing you're going to have to lose, and there would be no focus on what you're going to gain. And I, I know this from my own experience when I published my own report in January of this year and did offer up some options mm -hmm. and spent uh, to pay for the policy and spent all my time doing radio interviews explaining um, the, the issues about uh, 
the use of those particular benefits uh, and n never really getting a chance to talk about the actual benefit that people were going to get, which was the introduction of this uh, reform. So, so it is a very difficult area, and I think absolutely right. It would have been a mistake to have given the Commission that task. Yeah. Um, but interesting, from a charity perspective, I was put under that pressure mm. continuously. Uh, and what, to, to shut up? Uh, well, I'm, I'm frequently put under that pressure, <laughs> but uh, uh, the question, the way it was very much framed to me was, well, you have to move and you have to say, as the major organisation, that you will give up, mm. not that I'm in a position to give up anything, mm. but you will support getting rid of winter fuel payments. Mm. It's your only way. You're going to, you've got to have an either or, you can't have both. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I really don't exaggerate. It was intense at times, um, and refused to go down to go down that route. And in the end, um, when the money was found, it was done quite creatively, mm. if I recall, with a nice little swerve in the DWP found overnight. Mm. Um, and it's worth also pointing out that some of it came from inheritance tax, despite the bloody row about death tax a small before the election. Portion of it, yeah. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, my question is about um, the commission itself, the makeup of the commission. Uh, I'm a civil servant, and I'm interested to know how you, how the secretariat that you that were with you are, are decided, and to fly the kite that not all older civil servants are completely wedded to their departments. Yes. Yes. Um, Shall I just go on with the next one? Yep. We'll so bundle them together? Yeah. 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 Do, do, why don't we answer yeah. 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 one go? It's, it's slightly similar. Um, there's been talk about a public awareness campaign, and what strikes me is that um, there's also need for a political awareness campaign amongst the parties themselves. It seems that uh, in this particular case, the Commission has had very good contacts in the political sphere, and, has, and Andrew's worked at this a great deal. Um, but <coughs> if we're thinking about this and as a general template and a model, um, then it strikes me that the danger of having policy by review by a commission is that the parties themselves don't take ownership of it. And you really need to be very, very clear that um, there is enough back back it backing within the parties for it to get implemented. Um, starting early in the, in, the, in, the, in the period might be one way to do it. Another way might be, in fact, to have sufficient public awareness <laughs> that the pressure comes from the public back on the politicians. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my comment on that will be, I think the point that's made, been made several times about exhaustion is crucial. Everyone was bloody exhausted in this issue. Mm. So that opened a political, yeah. opened some room, political room for river. It was also in the coalition agreement. Mm. Yeah. So, I, so one of the other reasons that honestly I was willing to take it on whether it was mm. made a difference to norm, but you know, it was in the coalition agreement. The coalition agreement said, I, I can't quite remember it word for word anymore, I used to be able to quote it at some length, but it said we recognise the urgency of moving to tackle this problem. And so uh, I think that gave us a kind of, that gave us a bit of solid ground on which to stand. Um, how was the composition decided? Uh, well, I was involved at the very outset. Um, there was a decision about who the head of the secretary would be. The head of the secretary then worked with colleagues in the Department of Health to come up with an initial set of people, um, uh, but with the understanding that as our needs changed over time, we might need to, and, and as, uh, as uh, over time we added, in particular, we added a bit more analytical support, and you know, some people moved in and out. So it was decided essentially by the, by the commission itself, but from a starting point, and there was a good deal of yeah, there was a good deal of freedom moving in and out. Yeah. Um, there's one at the back over there. Yes, thank you. Uh. Um, Brendan Martin, Public World. I, I want particularly question for Michelle, perhaps, but perhaps for the whole panel. Do you think there were any downsides to your decision to have a moratorium for a while mm -hmm. on focusing on the crisis in care. And I'm thinking in particular of the issues that have emerged in the last few months uh, in h much higher in public consciousness about the nature of the workforce in social care and how they're employed and how they're paid. And when you look at those problems, 
you can only conclude that at the time of Dilnot, the <coughs> funding gap in social care was actually very much understated. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that may be a problem or whether you see that as having been inevitable. Um, do, you, do you want to hang on just a second? Okay. I'm getting a yeah. bit near the sure. end. Could, could you take the microphone of the lady down there? Thank you. And then we might come down here and then we'll have one more after that. Um, yes, Ruth Levitt, King's College, London. Um, I'd like to ask you about a remark you made um, that you, if I paraphrase you, you were sort of taken by surprise or you hadn't anticipated the uh, activities immediately after your launch. And uh, you also said, uh, in the end, politicians have to decide. So the question is, what now knowing those items, what would you do differently and how would you advise anyone subsequently addressing a tricky problem with all the virtues of the arrangements you've described, but how would you advise them to learn the lessons that you could now learn? Can I start back? Yep. So I can assure you there was never a moratorium. We never did that. Uh, we continued to make a consistently strong case about the current state of social care, in particular in England. Um, and there was evidence, research, we produced at highly significant periods, but recognised the point of influence and decision uh, was the comprehensive spending review for that. Uh, and that for a period when it looked like the Dilnot recommendations could be rejuvenated, brought back to life, the purpose was to focus on getting that commitment through in a relatively small time frame. And in the end, uh, it was my judgment that we could do both and be successful in both, but not if we continued to think that we could get an in-year settlement of more money for social care outside the process of the Comprehensive Spending Review, um, whereas I thought we could get the commitment for a Dilnot Commission. At the same time, started to run a number of other things, including the Dignity in Care Commission with the um, uh, local government authority and local government association and uh, the NHS conferred looking at dignity and care more broadly. So it's a bit horses for courses, but that message discipline at that time and the subtlety of when and how you shift to get you the decision you uh, want is, is really down to absolute discipline. Yeah, just to pick up on that, I mean, certainly I, 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 d I would, wouldn't recognise a period when um, the sector weren't putting pressure on about the funding of the system. I don't think I was doing any, any, went to any event where this did not come up, and certainly you seem to be forever approving quotes to respond to, to the, the latest, uh, latest salvo of research and other stuff. So, that, that, you know, that was a very real pressure. And the issue really is how do you then deal with that in a, in a mature way and not let it poison the relationships that are allowing you to do business on other things. And that was the important point. Um, and certainly the way that I, I and colleagues, I think, at Department of Health were approaching it, you know, that we understood that was part of the terms of doing business, that there was a legitimate debate to be had about funding, and it was entirely legitimate from my point of view for the sector to be articulating that point of view and campaigning on it. I think what it might do, because of the changes that are now going through, the reforms, it will mean that SR15 spending review 15 will be a spending review but it will be harder for government to just sideline social care because social care has now been elevated in terms of its profile and its attention. It had to sustain five years of attention effectively in this parliament. Try and think of a parliament where it's had a sustained five years of attention at this sort of level. You know, and I think that will materially affect the sort of quality of the debate and the extent to which others will be prepared to engage with and lobby whoever's in government after the election around funding of the care system. So I think you know, that long-term aspect of this is really very important. Ruth had two, two questions. One, uh, or two issues, the level of post-launch activity. I think you know, naively I, did, I, I had in my mind that it, it would stop when we launched and I would be able to get back to my day job. What I've learned from that is if you were, I, my advice to anyone taking something like this on would be be aware that actually there's going to be six months or so afterwards when the level of activity is likely to be as high as it was for much of that and it was. I was very lucky in my day job to be able to persuade them that 
this was a good thing to be doing. So I think planning for the post end event, and it's all, I think also be worth thinking about secretariat. And again, because of the way I was in the position I found myself in, I didn't need that. But uh, but if but there could have been there could yeah. be a need. So I think continuing it, with it support is very <coughs> Adair Turner insisted he keep his secretariat for yeah. some months afterwards yeah. to handle exactly what. Yeah. And I think that was probably a very yeah. wise thing. On the politicians, I mean. Pol politicians do decide, and, and at the very beginning of it, I think we had this conversation. We, I think we asked ourselves, what's the probability of something happening? And I think we thought maybe one in three. Yeah. Um, and and at one in three, it's it's worth taking up, take, taking on. So I think you know, be, and in, you know, we live in a democracy. The politicians are going to decide. Okay. I mean, I, I, what I would say is, and I'm not saying this just because Paul is here. I mean. I thought the collective political class behaved better than I thought they would behave uh, when, during the sittings of, and the work of the Commission. They did actually keep off our backs. Mm. Um, and, and I think that that's a lesson for the future. If you want to take an even more controversial subject, like the funding of the NHS, I wouldn't put the money on them leaving a Commission with something like that mm. alone for the period of their work. So I think they did, in this area, they behaved extremely well. But it also had the consequence, which I think was, was unforeseen and unintended, of making the sector more united. Mm. Mm. And through that capacity, I think, as a whole, it will continue to be like that. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, luck has a huge amount to do with it, Absolutely. and it is unknown, and you've got to try several things, and some things work, and there are many, many factors affecting each other and uh, one of my reflections would be the ability to one be resilient is hugely important and just to keep on going when everybody is telling you around you no it's not going to work is, is, is massively important. The second is discipline over your emotional response to these things because you have to stay incredibly focused and incredibly disciplined when all around you uh, perhaps aren't being and the pressure is on you to react mm. uh, emotionally or critically. So having the control to remain controlled uh, because that in itself gives you another day to, to fight on and, and keep things alive. That's great. We, we need to finish now. Uh, and I was going to say to each of the panel members, what would your one piece of advice to a future one be you've just given you? Oh, right, right. Okay, Andrew. very good. Uh, make sure you're appointed at the beginning of a parliament. Think small in terms of your size of commission. Keep it very narrowly focused. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Can you please thank the panel? For <laughs>